The perfect childhood. School is out, shoes are off, you're sprinting across the hot sandy beach, smiling for no apparent reason, because back then you didn't even need one. Did I mention there's an orange cone on your head? Where did it come from? Why is it there? What is the point? Do not think too deeply about it. There is no room for symbolism in the summer. There is no use overanalyzing the antics of teenage youth. It's just a cone, and you're just a kid, doing things for no other reason than that you want to. You're busy living, doing your thing. Responsibility is still years away. Such a pretty picture we're painting, isn't it? But this is SCP Explained, so of course by now, you figured out this is all a misdirection, didn't you? Well, here it comes. Watch closely. Look at you run, moving towards nothing as if it means everything. Look at that smile, the wind whipping through the gap in your teeth. Soak it in. In 20 years, your face muscles will have forgotten the movement. Look at you live. Yes, go on. Soak it in. You will be chasing this feeling your whole life while moving further and further away from it. Oof, depressing, isn't it? We think so too. But here is the silver lining, something you'd be wise to celebrate. At least you have this moment to look back on. The memory is with you forever. Not everyone is so lucky. Not everyone had a good childhood. Furthermore, not everyone even has a childhood at all. Some live beyond the expectations of age. Imagine a 14-year-old forced to be 40. That's not to say they have to pay taxes or can run for Senate. No, this level of forced maturity that I'm speaking of transcends the scope of average adulthood. So let's not imagine a kid going through the mundane life of a cubicle junkie, filing papers, pretending to work, and answering phone calls. Instead, let's do this. Imagine a kid going to war. Imagine a kid carrying out stealth assassination missions. Imagine a kid being locked in containment, living with little human interaction and freedom. This is all to say, imagine a kid not being a kid at all. Now this is more like an SCP Explained. This is the sad story of someone who had to say goodbye to the joys of adolescence earlier than anyone ever should have to. In fact, they didn't even get to say goodbye at all. This is the story of SCP-105. Now, to be clear, SCP-105 is not a bloodthirsty demon living in the shadows. It is not an unsquishable spider dancing across your hardwood floor, mocking the soles of your shoes as they stomp down with no success. It is not a grand piano in a hotel lobby absorbing the DNA of all who touches its keys. And it is not a freezer that tempts late night snackers to reach deeper and deeper towards an ever elusive hot fudge sundae until they are sucked in frozen solid, sold for millions and displayed as decorative ice sculptures atop the center of punch bowls at parties for rich politicians. No, we'll just have to get to those later on on a different day. Because SCP-105 is just, mm, how do I put this, a girl. Yes, a small, unremarkable looking girl. At the time of acquisition, she was just 1.5 meters tall and weighed 50 kilograms. Even those of you listening with little to no instinctual senses for converting meters and kilograms to feet and pounds can still understand this is no frightful giant we're talking about. Lining up a class by height, she'd blend in somewhere toward the middle. And if you look even closer, beyond the shallow surface of measurements and toward the details of her face, even still, you won't find a single freckle to fear. SCP-105 has blue eyes and blonde hair, nothing coastal Californians haven't seen a million times over just this Monday. Formerly known as Iris Thompson, SCP-105 has no discernible oddities. If you saw her jumping rope, you wouldn't point and stare. If you saw her at the park, playing with your children, you wouldn't pull them away and squeeze them tight. If you saw her walking toward you on a sidewalk, you wouldn't turn around and run away in the other direction. By herself, SCP-105 is not too different from anyone else. No matter how close we zoom in on her appearance, personality, or her tendencies, there is nothing to see that triggers alarms. If you ask her to spit fire, 
she won't. If you conduct a lab experiment where she has to find the exit of a maze using only her sense of smell, she will get lost and fail. This is all to say if you look too closely through the microscope at SCP-105, you might miss her anomalous abilities. Instead, you'd be better off taking a step back and just watching her live her life. And that is all that she wanted to do live her life. Is that so much to ask? The first thing you will notice is that she isn't alone. And like in any good buddy-buddy film, her counterpart reveals more to her character. So who is standing by her side? Who is the co-star of this film that pushes our protagonist into the Foundation spotlight? Well, it's no person at all. It's a camera. Her camera. SCP-105-B is a Polaroid 1 Step Express, manufactured in 1982. It does not appear to have any out-of-the-ordinary physical characteristics and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal Polaroid camera, operating as expected for all persons aside from SCP-105. When you point it at a subject, they don't get sucked into the lens. The flash can't blind an army of soldiers. When you say cheese, it doesn't shoot out a brick of cheddar. The camera is nothing more than a camera. That is, until it's in the hands of Iris Thompson. What's more unique than the camera itself are the photographs it produces. When SCP-105 holds a photograph taken by SCP-105-B, the picture changes from a still shot to that of a real-time image of the person, location, or object photographed. Regardless of the subject of the photograph, the image will convert itself into what appears to be a handheld live stream of whatever was pictured. Imagine a photograph of a waterfall. If held by SCP-105, you do not just see the image of a waterfall, but you will physically see the water falling, splashing down onto the rocks below. It is similar to holding your cell phone and watching a GIF. However, instead of just watching, Iris is able to interact with it in a way beyond any technology has ever allowed. SCP-105 is then able to move her arm through and into the photograph and manipulate objects within reach of the original point at which the photograph was first taken. Yes, you heard me right. SCP-105-2 doesn't just offer Iris quick prints of memories, it gives her much more, granting her access to a new dimension. Although this is clearly a unique situation for Iris, it doesn't mean that Iris is the only one affected by this anomaly. When she engages with the photographs, it actually affects the world attached to them. That is to say, there are consequences to her actions. Every photograph she has ever taken is essentially a portal to a world of problems. Witnesses who have been on the other side of the photograph while SCP-105 was manipulating it reported seeing her hand reaching out from an invisible portal and carrying on whatever actions she pleases. Once her arm is inside the photograph, she has the freedom to control the image as she wishes. This ability has obvious benefits for anyone. Imagine being able to carry around with you a photograph of your oven. Then, whenever you get that paranoid feeling that you forgot to turn it off, you can reach into the Polaroid and turn the dial how you please. But the peace of mind is just a small benefit of this power, and it's easy to assume that anyone would be tempted to use their abilities for far more than just controlling at-home kitchen appliances while on vacation. The Foundation specifically concerns itself with bigger, more ambitious uses of anomalous power. And the power in this case wasn't just in the camera. While 105-B helps Iris use her powers most efficiently, she is still able to manipulate objects through photographs taken by other cameras, though not quite as well as when she's using her favorite camera. Noting that 105-B and the photographs taken by said camera have no unusual properties when used by any other person except for SCP-105, it was clear to the Foundation who the greater anomaly in the situation really was. The tool wasn't of their interest, but rather the person wielding it. But how did this all come to their attention? Is the Foundation really investigating the life of a girl playing with a camera in her bedroom? Well, some moments are just too big to be bound by privacy. SCP-105 was brought to the forefront of the Foundation's attention shortly after the murder of her boyfriend. Promptly after his death, the police investigated the scene and looked for answers. 
and when looking for answers, they started conjuring up questions, one of which put Iris at the center of their search. Where were you? Her response wasn't so straightforward. She wasn't there, but then she was. The police pressed further, not understanding. SCP-105 explained that she was at home, but once she learned of his death, she hurried over to him. This left the police even more suspicious, as there was no way she could have been informed of the murder by an outside source. She must have been there all along. Seeing the skepticism in their faces, SCP-105 scrambled for an explanation. She took a deep breath and got her story straight. She claimed to have been on the phone with her boyfriend at the time of the violent attack, and once she heard the commotion, it prompted her to hurry over to his location, where she saw him dead. This excuse made logical sense, and so the police dropped their suspicion. After all, Iris was just a small, innocent teenager. However, just as quickly as the police moved on from Iris, they returned to her, this time with tangible proof of their doubts. The telephone records did not correspond to her story. She was never on the phone with her boyfriend that night. It was then that SCP-105 had to confess. She informed her lawyer that she had, in fact, been there for the murder. Well, not there, but kind of there. She explained how she witnessed the murder through a photograph she had taken with her boyfriend several days prior. The attorney in question disregarded the story and recommended that the subject plead guilty. Iris, however, refused to do so. She was sticking to her truth, no matter how crazy it made her seem. She went forward and told her story in court. It was met with derision. The judge and the jury didn't even entertain the possibility of any of it being true. Iris was flustered. She was a young teenage girl fighting for her freedom, her only weapon being the truth. But the room wasn't participating in her reality. They dismissed her as crazy. And so, when Iris offered to demonstrate her ability, it was the last straw. The judge wouldn't allow Iris to waste any more of anyone's time. She was sentenced to a psychiatric ward. Iris was determined to get out of there. She knew she didn't belong. Luckily, someone else knew, too, that she didn't belong. And because of this, in a matter of days, she was out of there. But home wasn't where she was heading. No, it wasn't mom and dad picking her up from the psychiatric ward, but rather the foundation breaking her out, stealing her for themselves, and bringing her to Site 17. There at Site 17, Foundation personnel began their mission, which started with trying to convince SCP-105 that they were on her side. They began by retrieving SCP-105-B from SCP-105's home and replacing it with an identical model, only then to give it to her under the lie that it was the original. The lies wouldn't stop just there. They'd continue to pour over her reality until it was impossible for her to recognize one from the other. SCP-105's parents was informed that she was killed during the botched escape of another patient, while both were in the custody of a psychiatric care facility. In truth, though, the Foundation wants nothing more than to keep SCP-105 alive. However, they are not concerned about the quality of her living. Iris was a tool for the Foundation. She was an asset. She was a secret weapon. She had powers they could have only dreamed of. Only now, they existed. But before shooting their shiny new weapon, they needed to learn how to use it properly. But with what manual? How do you learn how to use another human? Well, having seen enough Marvel movies, they knew they would be better equipped with knowledge if they understood her origin story. So they began questioning Iris, trying to get to the root cause of her anomalous aptitude. She was either 10 or 11. She remembers because she was looking at a picture of the ocean, and she noticed that the waves began moving. Her parents said that she just had an overactive imagination. When she first was able to move objects in the photos, she was 11, 12 maybe. Her family took a trip to the Grand Canyon. She looked through the photo album after they got home, and she brushed her hand up against one by accident. When she did, she pushed a rock over the edge, falling into the canyon. She could actually hear it clatter on the way down. She became fascinated with photography after that. Most of the time, it didn't work with photographs she took, but her parents got her a Polaroid One-Step Express camera that she'd been begging them for since Christmas. After she got the camera, the photos got easier to interact with. After hearing her story, the researchers made her an offer. She'd be allowed certain freedoms if she agreed to use her powers to do them a few favors. She could, at least in some capacity, act her age, socialize, and do things a girl her grade would normally do. But in exchange, 
she had to first do things that nobody any age should ever have to do. Iris agreed, and it was in this agreement that we see just how desperate she was during her childhood. She was willing to risk everything for something as small as a quick conversation with a guard, five minutes of jump rope, or simply a few minutes spent under the sun. She was assigned to be part of Mobile Task Force Omega-7 to carry out a wide range of missions. And if the fate of the first humanoid SCP recruited to Mobile Task Force Omega-7 was any indication how this might play out, Iris was in a lot of trouble. The Pandora's Box initiative had a history of failure. Their previous efforts under Team Abel ended in the death of absolutely everyone. However, Team Iris began on a more hopeful note. They carried out different missions than Team Abel. Instead of violent attacks, their primary missions were reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. However, just because there were no swords and blood drawn, the missions were not so harmless. Despite Team Iris carrying out over 20 jobs in cooperation with the Bow Commission, swiftly and without incident, their streak eventually had to come to an end. The first disciplinary incident for SCP-105 involved the escalation of Team Iris missions from reconnaissance to assassinations. Yes, this teenage girl with not a violent bone in her body was tasked to kill. Note that her only power is that of manipulating photos. In her mind, this is nothing more than a party trick. It was a gift she was born with, and she was always aware that it was unique, but never did she expect it to be a curse. She liked being able to straighten books and photographs of libraries. She liked being able to read into photos and hug her teddy bear that she no longer has. She liked being able to help, heal, and embrace history, not alter it. SCP-105 violently opposed the use of her abilities to carry out assassinations. They wanted her to murder people, and like any girl of her nature would, she resisted, but they kept pressing. While some teenage girls are pressured by parents to play sports they don't particularly care for, this one was pressured to kill. During these events, SCP-105 became emotionally distressed and attempted to deceive Foundation personnel into believing that her anomalous traits had disappeared. She claimed that she couldn't carry out the missions anymore. Her doctor submitted a report recommending that SCP-105 be reclassified as neutralized, undergo amnestic treatment, and be released to the public with regular monitoring. After further investigation, the Foundation realized the doctor was prioritizing SCP-105's emotional state over the goals of the Foundation. They had built a friendship. He was the one telling her to pretend not to have powers anymore. This was all found out. Thus, his recommendation to release Iris was denied. With nothing to lose at that point, the doctor even helped Iris try to escape the Foundation's custody. But this failed. She was captured, and the doctor was promptly discharged. At that point, Iris had to start over again to regain the trust of the Foundation. In yet another compromise, she re-demonstrated her anomalous abilities in exchange for the restoration of limited privileges. Nothing more than occasionally being allowed to jump rope, getting a lollipop every Thursday, and being informed of the recent trends on TikTok. And so, this is where we know her to be. Continuously making sacrifices in exchange for tiny teaspoons of teenage life. All the while she is growing older and older, unfulfilled by the years she passes. And so while it is easy to look back on our childhood with lust and longing, at least it was there, and is still there now, safely stored in our memory, stored in the protection of the past. For Iris, this is not so. Her childhood is both behind her and in front of her. It is something she moved on from too quickly, and it is a future she fights for every day. Even when she is 97, gray, decrepit, and on her deathbed, she will be sacrificing her freedoms to feel 15. And so we have to wonder, is SCP-105 a danger to anyone at all? I leave you with a question. Are we more likely to be attacked by a dog? or the master holding its leash. Now go check out SCP-053 Young Girl and SCP-3082 Neverland's Lost Boys and Girls for more peculiar anomalous children.